On behalf of the BMJ, the University of Bristol, the University of Newcastle, welcome to this webinar on the origins of COVID-19. This series of webinars stems from an editorial uh, by George Davy Smith and Marcus Monafo in the BMJ, published on the 19th of October um, 2020. Uh, COVID-19 Known Unknowns was the title, and the subtitle was The More Certain Someone Is About COVID-19, The Less You Should Trust Them. The editorial expressed concern about the polarisation of debates and hardening of positions on key issues, making it hard to make progress with knowledge. It called on us all to move away from certainty and to respect uncertainty. It said acknowledging uncertainty a little more might improve not only the atmosphere of the debate and the science but also public trust. And that is the spirit of this series of webinars. As you know, today's webinar is on the origins of COVID-19, not an uncontroversial topic. Uh, previous topics have been children and schools, testing on asymptomatic people, vaccines, zero COVID, new variants, long COVID, COVID and mental health, and vaccination in children, all of which are available on the BMJ's YouTube channel, which is where this one will also be posted. The next webinar is on population immunity and will be on Thursday, November the 11th. This one is being live streamed on BMJ's YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com forward slash the BMJ, where you will find all the others as well. Uh, we have a really good number of people of you joining us around the world. We have some great speakers, great chairs and some tight timing. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, please also tweet using the hashtag COVID unknowns. Uh, questions you can put via the Q&A function and we will put as many as possible to the speakers in the discussions at the end. We have two sessions, uh, the first setting the scene and the second exploring the complexity. And to chair the first session, let me hand over to George Davy smith Thanks very much, uh, Fiona. Um, so I'm going to go straight in by introducing our first uh, speaker, who's Diego Forney. Uh, and he is going to talk about the about the, how the four seasonal uh, circulating endemic coronaviruses uh, entered humans. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Now we will talk about the four circulating endemic coronaviruses. First, I want to say that I have no conflict of interest to declare. So as all uh, we know, SARS-CoV-2 is the causative agent of uh, COVID-19, and it's a coronavirus. But coronaviruses are a very large group of uh, RNA viruses that belongs to the coronaviridae family. All these viruses share a similar genome organization with a large preprotein for structural proteins and various accessory proteins, both in terms of function and uh, numbers. Coronaviruses are usually classified into four genera, called alpha, beta, gamma and delta coronaviruses. They infect uh, several animals, including mammals and non-mammals. Bat and rodents are the main reservoir of most uh, alpha and beta uh, genera, while birds are the natural host of gamma uh, and uh, delta coronaviruses. Coronaviruses have an ancient origin. It has been estimated that uh, the alpha and beta genera uh, separated from the gamma and the delta uh, one uh, millions of years ago. Another important feature of these viruses is that uh, host jump are frequent events among them. This means that a coronavirus, a coronavirus can jump from an animal host to another uh, very easily and infect it. Several, uh, coronaviruses infect several uh, animals, including uh, humans. There are seven uh, coronaviruses that can infect the human population. There are the, well, the three well-known uh, highly pathogenic uh, coronaviruses called SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS. All of three are beta coronaviruses, and all, all of them derived from uh, uh, bat coronaviruses. Along with them, there are other four uh, coronaviruses called uh, endemic coronaviruses that induce only mild, mild uh, upper respiratory disease. They are also called uh, common cold coronaviruses. They are endemic, meaning that uh, they persist uh, in human population. All of them are seasonal uh, and generate short-term uh, immunity. This means that their uh, infection uh, by, uh, from these viruses is very common uh, within one or two years. They, on, they usually induce uh, mild uh, diseases, but in rare cases, some of them can also cause uh, severe infection in infants and in elderly people. 
Two of these uh, four endemic coronaviruses are beta coronaviruses, and they are called OC43 and uh, HKU1. The other two are alpha coronaviruses, and they are called uh, 229E and NL63. All these uh, five viruses originated uh, in animals, and uh, it's been estimated that uh, the endemic coronaviruses entered the human population in the last 1,000 uh, years. So now we will look at the uh, detail of each of these uh, coronaviruses. In particular, we start with the, the 229E. It's the first uh, human coronavirus isolated. It was isolated in 1966 from cell culture in the US. Its infections are highly prevalent in children, especially at the beginning of their life. This uh, virus is classified as was classified entity, it's classified as an alpha coronavirus, and it's clustered with several bat uh, coronaviruses. This means that uh, this virus is uh, genetically similar to um, uh, coronaviruses that infect uh, bats. But uh, this uh, similarity is not sufficient to consider a uh, bat as the zoonotic source of the human uh, virus. Uh, in fact, this, this uh, zoonotic source was uh, unknown until 2007, when a very similar virus was uh, found uh, in alpacas in the South America. After that, in 2015, uh, several other uh, related viruses were found in bats and uh, in bats and in camels. Uh, the camels ones, with the camels uh, one, camel ones were, were very important because they were basically identical to the alpacas uh, virus. So these uh, uh, findings suggest that. Uh, uh, bats were the ancestral host, host of this uh, virus, and that this virus jumped from bats to camels and alpacas, and then from camels and alpacas, it spilled, uh, spilled over into the human population. So now we can estimate when this uh, last event happened, and it was estimated that uh, the 229E separated from the camel alpha coronaviruses in the 18th century, uh, more or less 250 years ago. And after that, it spread uh, uh, in all over human uh, population. So after that, uh, after this uh, virus in, in 1967, the OC43 was uh, isolated uh, from a human tracheal explant uh, in organ culture, as uh, it's called the OC. Um, this virus is uh, as an ancestral host, uh, and the ancestral host of this virus are rodents instead of bats for the 229E. And uh, more interesting, um, this virus showed a remarkable antigenic and genetic similarities with uh, abovine uh, coronaviruses. So we can imagine that cows uh, were the zoonotic source of uh, the OC43 uh, virus. So we can say that, uh, as uh, we did before, uh, rodents were the uh, ancestral host of uh, OC43. And then, and then from that, it, this virus jumped in uh, cows. And then from cows, cows, it jumped in human population. Again, we can estimate when this uh, event uh, happened, and it was, it was proposed that uh, uh, this virus entered the human population uh, in the 1890, uh, more or less 130 years ago. This is very interesting because uh, this time uh, overlapped quite well with a human pandemic that happened uh, in, the, in the same uh, period. This pandemic was caused by a still unknown uh, pathogen, and it was proposed uh, that uh, it was OC43. But there is no sufficient, sufficient data to confirm this hypothesis. The only information we, ha we have is this uh, uh, similar uh, timing of the two different uh, events. So after OC43, for nearly 40 years, no human coronavirus uh, was, coronavirus was uh, detected. Um, until the SARS-CoV pandemic in, the two, two, in, two, in two, two, 2002, and, and so after that, there was a boost in looking for uh, um, new uh, and undiscovered uh, coronaviruses. So in the next uh, two years, the last two endemic coronaviruses were uh, discovered. In particular, in 2004, it, the NL63 was discovered uh, firstly in Netherlands and then uh, basically uh, everywhere in the world. It is disintegrated to alpha coronaviruses that uh, were found in uh, bats uh, from America and uh, Europe. And more recently, another uh, related coronaviruses was found in Africa and uh, bats in Kenya. But all these viruses are not so, too similar to the NL63 to consider them as the zoonotic source of uh, this uh, human virus. And we are still missing the link between the, the bats and the humans. So basically, we are still missing the intermediate host for NL63. So, so we cannot estimate when this virus, virus 
uh, entered the in human population. But at least we can estimate how long it has been present in human. And it is estimated that it has been circulating in human population since at least the 1940. So basically after uh, that, uh, the last uh, endemic coronavirus was discovered in, uh, at the Hong Kong University in 2005, that is called the HKU1. Again, no closely related virus has been found in other animals, but this virus like OC43 is genetically similar to rodent coronaviruses. Uh, but again, like NL63, these genetic similarities is not so high to consider uh, bats as the intermediate host of HKU1. So again, we can see that uh, um, most likely uh, rodents are the uh, ancient, ancient reservoir for uh, HKU1. And then from that, uh, it's, it's spilled, the virus is spilled in the an interme unknown intermediate host. And then from that, it's spilled in human population. And again, we can, est we can estimate how long this virus has been circulating uh, in human. It's been estimated that it, the, it, is, it, is, it has been present since 1950. So in conclusion, we can say that coronaviruses uh, are a very large group of uh, viruses that infect several mammal and non-mammal animals. Rodents that are, that are the largest mammalian group are underrepresented in coronavirus studies, and they should be screened in detail for looking for uh, new and unknown coronaviruses. Regarding human coronaviruses, we can say that they have been infecting human population for at least hundreds of years, but we are still missing some very important detail about uh, um, their, uh, their origin and evolution. And finally, finding intermediate, intermediate host is very important for, for, to understand the past, evolu past history of these viruses, but also to monitor and prevent possible future uh, spillover. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Diego. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, uh, Bart uh, Hagmans from uh, Erasmus, uh, who is going to tell us uh, about the origins of, SAR of SARS and MERS. Yes, hopefully this works a bit better. So you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Very good. So I'll uh, no relevant conflict of interest to declare. And uh, Diego very much focused on the, the virus that caused a common cold, the seasonal coronaviruses. And I'll focus on MERS coronavirus and the SARS coronaviruses. And to start with MERS coronavirus that actually was identified in early uh, 2012, um, um, and then <clears throat> what's interesting to note here is that um, uh, in time, if you look at the uh, 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 epidemic curve, so the human cases, it is a typical pattern of different outbreaks, especially in the Middle East, uh, hospital related and totally different than what you see in the pandemic. So one big wave. So actually the idea is, and <clears throat> that was early on uh, discovered that Actually, this is initiated by uh, independent spillovers continuously from dromedary camels. And uh, the first indications for that came from Qatar in that <clears throat> in the phylogenetic analysis here in black are viruses, MERS-like virus, MERS viruses from human cases, and then <clears throat> traced back uh, uh, two cases in Qatar to uh, the farm where they were working. Uh, um, um, that also the, the camels there were found positive, not only for antibodies against the virus, but also for the virus itself. And interestingly, if you uh, look at the picture below, is that uh, these uh, farms were, uh, many farms here are located near a camel racing tracks so or something that's particularly quite different than the picture a few decades ago. So indicating possibly also factors that affect the, uh, uh, the, the transmission of the virus, which were not present early on. So, uh, <clears throat> but uh, not only in Saudi Arabia, uh, dromedary camels are seropositive for the virus, uh, but also in Africa. So that's quite interesting because also if you look at the timing of, 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 of samples being positive goes back to 92, so already early on, <clears throat> uh, uh, camels in Africa seem to be uh, harboring this, this virus, whereas we don't, haven't seen outbreaks in Africa, uh, but uh, uh, 
a number in uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, one of the reasons could be, as indicated, the difference in behavior in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, but of course, it's also interesting to look at the virus itself. And that's indicated here with a recent study by the group in Hong Kong by, by Malik Paris, showing that if you look at the different viruses found in, in dromedaries and in humans, so in red, you find isolates uh, from dromedary camels in this clay B, clearly indicating that they're closely related, similar as the observation in Qatar that has now been extended. But if you look in, in Africa, these are only uh, uh, camel viruses that have been uh, uh, sequenced so far. So although there are indications by serology that there is or not a transmission in Africa, the picture in the Middle East uh, is quite different that you find both the virus being present in, in dromedary camels, but also in humans. And it's interesting to note that uh, viruses <clears throat> isolated from Africa, if you compare them for the behavior in, uh, in cells, in human cells, and that's depicted on the right, you find that in red and uh, dark blue, the, the viruses that uh, were isolated from dromedary camels replicate to a lower extent compared to the viruses in the Middle East, indicating that probably there's also limited uh, changes in the viruses that have led to the emergence of the virus and the outbreak. So only then the virus was, was, was characterized uh, and, uh, but looking back, the virus was already circulating, of course, uh, much earlier. And so if you look at the picture, what we have now on the zonal transmission of MERS-CoV, uh, indicating here <clears throat> the virus potentially coming from bed, so the near ancestors have not been identified uh, to that extent as the, the SARS-CoV-related viruses, but clearly there's a virus present in, in dromedary camels. And the fact is that the receptor for this virus is quite the same in dromedary camels and humans, allowing the zone of transmission of the virus to humans uh, and outbreaks in, in, in the Middle East mainly. So that's a picture of most coronavirus. And the case is that the virus doesn't need to change that much. So the virus is very similar. So if you look at SARS-CoV, so the outbreak in 2002, 2003, uh, actually the idea is that <clears throat> based on the findings in 2005, that the virus is present in in uh, bats, especially in Southwest uh, China, and then uh, through an intermediate host, the civet cat infected humans. And uh, important to note is that from the phylogenetic analysis here, there is indication that these viruses in humans were quite different than the earlier isolate identified in, in, in civet. So uh, the idea that you need evolution of these SARS related viruses to be potentially uh, have the potency to, to infect humans. And uh, so that was the current idea. And this was also based on the presence of the virus in civet cat, both by antibody and by, by PCR. And uh, also later in, in the outbreak in 2003, early 2004, there was an outbreak related to a, a restaurant where uh, civet cats were uh, for dinner. And these viruses actually caused a mild SARS in, in four. Uh, uh, for individuals, and based on that, the civets were uh, killed. Actually, it was one of the measures taken to to contain the outbreak, but clearly indicating that civets could be a source of the virus. But uh, in the meantime, later on, uh, there have been studies, uh, especially with the Bar from the Barrett lab and the uh, Shengli Shi from Wuhan, indicating that virus related uh, to these uh, SARS-CoV viruses that caused the outbreak and are found in bats, uh, when uh, reconstituted uh, genetically. So if you, it's very difficult to culture these viruses from bats directly, I must say. So that didn't work. So if you then make a <clears throat> infectious clone, and that's what Ralph Barrick did, and uh, try to uh, rescue these viruses, actually what you uh, can see is that um, these viruses are able to, to infect uh, primate cells, indicating that they have the potency to, for zoonotic transmission to humans directly. So that in the picture of SARS-CoV uh, and also based on earlier observations also fuels the, the idea that not only there could be an intermediate host but also direct transmission from uh, viruses being present in bats to humans and that there could be a spillover back to uh, other animal species. And, and actually this is also what we have seen for example in the Netherlands and Denmark 
that mink are very susceptible to infection by humans. So I would say also for SARS-CoV in 2003, the jury is still out, I think, to, to a certain extent. And the question is how this now fits in the, the picture of SARS-CoV-2 in that the virus is uh, identified and sequenced uh, from China early on, clearly indicate a relationship not only to SARS-CoV-1, but clearly to the SARS-CoV-related viruses found in, 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 in bats. And I won't go in too much detail, but I think, uh, uh, the, the, of course, the, the, the big question is, is, is there an intermediate host? And so far from China, there is clearly no evidence for an intermediate host. And I think one study uh, which is of interest to, to show is a recent preprint from uh, uh, people working in the um, um, uh, Institute Pasteur in, 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 in Laos, uh, in collaboration with, with Paris, is that if you look at the, the area there in Southwest China, which connects to Vietnam and Northern Laos, there are multiple caves with, 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 with bats, uh, with different species of bats, uh, but they clearly harbor different uh, viruses, re SARS-related viruses. And they only had a snapshot of, of samples analyzed. And I mean, there are millions of bats uh, having uh, where a one to five percent can be positive for, for coronaviruses, but clearly these viruses are related to the SARS-CoV-2 viruses based on full length. But more interestingly, uh, fecal material from 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 the, some of these bats actually, when inoculated on viral cells, cause the virus to replicate, indicating that especially in that shown on the right, that conservation of the RBD. Is, uh, is the, the case here and very much the same RBD leading to the transmission uh, uh, to, to the potency to infect uh, uh, human cells. So I would say I've said something on MERS. I think the, the, the main thing is we can learn also from the MERS outbreaks. And I think especially the huge diversity and the capacity of the viruses to recombine, I would say gain of function uh, in nature happens. And uh, so that's why you gain a lot of diversity. And uh, it could be that some of these viruses actually jumped the species very early on, as we have seen from MERS-CoV in Africa. But we should also remember that NL63 and uh, HQ1 have been only discovered after SARS in 2003 um, and were present all over the world. So in some cases, these viruses may spread unnoticed. And with that, I close and give the, uh, the floor back. That's great, Bart. Thanks very much. Uh, just to remind people that you can put questions that, uh, in the Q&A and that they'll be then brought up. Like there's a question for Bart I've seen already in the Q&A uh, uh, and, and they, the speakers might answer some of them uh, in the Q&A or they'll be brought up uh, in the uh, last half hour in the uh, discussion uh, uh, section. So I'm uh, now going to move on to uh, Marion Koopmans, uh, also from... Uh, Erasmus, uh, who's going to uh, tell us uh, what do we need to know in order to investigate the origins of a SARS outbreak. Yes, thank you. And you are pulling up my slides. David is pulling up your slides. Yeah. 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 Great. One moment, please. This is the wrong slide set. This is not me. I'm so sorry. I'll be with you in just a moment. Right. Thank you. 
There we go. There we go. One second. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, so what I uh, chose to do is to present some of the uh, uh, lines of investigation that were done as part of the China mission. So that's also my, my declaration of interest that I was part of that. So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this starts with a summary um, graph that we prepared for the uh, report that, that was made by the WHO uh, team uh, or the joint uh, team, which summarizes uh, what we felt are the potential routes of emergence of this uh, new uh, pandemic. Uh, with uh, a likely animal host, bats or another animal, potentially directly spilling over to humans um, uh, through an intermediary host, potentially introduced through contamination events at the food chain, or potentially through uh, something that happened in, in or around the laboratory. And as you can see to the right, our assessment based on the pieces of evidence available then was uh, graded from most likely to least likely uh, listing the zoonotic uh, origin um, as the most uh, likely. Next slide, please. So what we did there is a series of studies that were in our mandate. So the mandate, the way that works is this is something that is negotiated between the World Health Organization and China. That was done in uh, the first half of uh, 2020. And then uh, an international team of scientists was invited to help uh, conduct uh, those studies. And the what it essentially described was a series uh, of studies to construct, well, to, to reconstruct what we currently know uh, about the early stage of the pandemic, the early events in the pandemic. So next slide, please. So these um, studies uh, were along, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm hesitating here because I think I, I have the wrong slide set, but anyway, these studies were in different categories. First was epidemiology studies, really uh, aiming to assess what is known in trends of respiratory disease in December, but particularly also in the period before that. Then to the right, uh, studies addressing uh, animal um, and environmental questions, again, uh, to assess the potential animal sources. Uh, to the left, virology studies, looking at the genomic information uh, to see what that could tell us. And then finally, bringing together all that information into a first assessment of what, where do we think the, uh, the evidence is. Next slide, please. So just to help understand the conditions, uh, so this was this mandate was discussed between WSO and China. We were brought in uh, in November and discussed a series of studies that we would like to see done, um, and then went to China for uh, what is called then joint work. But that was two weeks from a hotel room in quarantine, and then two weeks with. Uh, the uh, ability to do uh, site, uh, site visits and interviews uh, and some face-to-face -face meetings. Next slide. Um, so the, anyone who has read the report knows, so there's a series of epidemiological studies that look at, do we find any indication for earlier rise in respiratory disease trends in the weeks or months before the end of December when the first uh, cases were notified. This is one of the uh, results, and this is an analysis of uh, mortality statistics from uh, Wuhan. Uh, and in red is where when mortality is elevated compared to the three previous years. And what you can see is aside from just a few flags uh, earlier on, you see a clear band to the lower right of the, the graph, which is the increase in mortality, in excess mortality in the second uh, half of January, reflecting widespread circulation in December. Next slide, please. 
Um, that, so from all the studies combined, there is a list of uh, very likely uh, and confirmed patients uh, throughout December that is shown here. And that's uh, 174 patients for which the uh, combined evidence seems to be quite uh, credible. Uh, and what is also done, what also was done is to look at what the exposures of these people were. And as you can tell in the bottom graph, uh, some of them had exposure to the Huanan seafood market, but certainly, and certainly not in the second half of December, certainly not all of them uh, saying that that, uh, that that was not entirely clear. So conclusion from the uh, EPI work was there was widespread circulation in December from all the trend data, no real evidence that that was earlier than December. The Huanan market was a super spreading event, that's for sure, maybe also where the place where it started, but that cannot be concluded. Um, and there is a need to study, uh, to, to look with different types of studies, whether there were earlier cases, but not visible in surveillance, which is a very crude uh, tool. And that is a recommendation to do population-wide zero surveys that uh, haven't happened yet. Next slide. So then the next step was to look at where these first cases, recognized cases were, and this is now plotted on a market um, a map, uh, a big market with a west area and an east area and a big road, busy road in between it. And as you can tell, there clearly were more cases on the uh, left, uh, on the west uh, area of the market. Next slide. So then what was done is to look for each of the market stalls, what products were sold, um, uh, and what category of products they were. So top left is uh, aquatic, top right wild animal meat, uh, bottom right poultry meat, and bottom left other animal uh, meat. Next slide. So from a very detailed uh, and stall by stall uh, inventory, it was clear that the supply chain is extremely complex and brings in uh, uh, meat and animals from uh, different regions in China and uh, outside of China, um, and that there were clear links with wild animal uh, supplies from the region that Bart Hagmas just mentioned, uh, where a high prevalence of SARS-related coronaviruses are found in wildlife, but no evidence uh, from uh, surveys in animals uh, other than bats that uh, of related viruses. Uh, but what we also concluded is there was clearly a lack of data on fur animals, which um, uh, have, uh, we know from other countries, how, just how susceptible they are. So that's a need for further study. Next slide, please. So then the third piece of evidence was by looking at genomic information. So this is going back to the raw uh, data for, from uh, that was available about sequences that had been provided early on um, and reanalyzing them because they had been generated on different platforms. And if you really want to zoom in on the early stages, you have to really understand the quality of the, the sequence data. So this is a reconstruction of the genomic data from the first recognized uh, cases where you see that there already is two clusters, that there is some diversity. So that told us these were really not the first cases. So that again, re-emphasizes the need to look back further to find uh, pa um, patients earlier to the origin of this uh, pandemic. Next slide. Um, and uh, there's an interesting observation if you then add in uh, sequence data from uh, slightly later from uh, the wider region, including uh, outside of China, where you see now a, a sort of a, a gray cluster sitting in between the two main uh, clusters. And those were all patients from another province um, west of uh, uh, Hubei, uh, where uh, uh, it looks like something uh, specific was circulating there. And we have recommended similar studies as the ones that were done in, in uh, Wuhan for that region in Sichuan. Next slide. Um, this is then uh, looking at what is available from uh, uh, animal uh, genome sequencing. 
uh, that was uh, what was available was, of course, the data on SARS-related coronaviruses in bats, including the RATG13 virus. But uh, since then, um, several additional SARS-related coronaviruses have been identified, including the ones that were just also mentioned in the paper uh, from Laos uh, that uh, genetically uh, are have similar relationship or a similar distance, you might say, as the RITG13 virus. But um, if you look at the receptor binding uh, uh, domain uh, are more similar to SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, pointing again at the need for wider surveys is what we concluded. Next slide. So, and then finally, what we uh, added uh, that was not in the mandate, but was uh, ju just to discuss the potential for a laboratory incident in the laboratories that have been involved in the early stages uh, of uh, the pandemic. So the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which of course has been quite uh, widely in the news, but also the uh, CDC laboratory of Wuhan and of Hubei and the agricultural lab and some clinical laboratories in the hospitals that had the first uh, uh, patients. Um, looking at uh, how they worked, uh, what their safety programs were, what their health monitoring programs were, and whether or not they had tested staff and had had staff with uh, illness. Um, and from that, we did not find any evidence for a lab-related uh, event, uh, but also said, of course, if you go back and do further studies and come up with a cluster of early, the earliest possible cases, those are the ones where you really would like to ask those questions as well. Next slide. So that's back then to the, the, the final uh, summary, the starting point. Um, um, uh, so that's that's the different pieces of uh, information, and that's why we have concluded um, zoonotics still uh, ranking uh, highest on our list. Um, uh, although, of course, other options are very difficult to rule out. I think that is part or should be part of the discussion of all of this. Um, there is an important point that I would like to make in relation to all the debates that we see and hear about in the newspapers in that the criticism of this report was already circulated before we had finished writing it. So there is, uh, and it's important to realize that it, uh, I think we need to stick to the uh, science in this discussion. And I think this is my last slide. Yeah. And I will stop here. Thanks very much, Marian. That's, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, so we're going to uh, move to uh, Jacques van Helden, who's going to uh, talk to us about the importance of keeping an open mind. Yep. So, uh, can you see? Okay. Uh, so uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar because uh, this was a long-awaited uh, initiative. And uh, I will uh, start with a disclaimer about, uh, well, more precisely, I would like to, to show you my point of view, my standpoint. So I'm professor of bioinformatics and my specialty is uh, genome analysis. And uh, I have uh, no uh, conflicts of interest. I am not directly involved in the consequences of whether the virus comes uh, from a natural origin or from a lab. I have no prior conviction about SARS-CoV-2 origin. I'm open to all the hypotheses, and I don't aim at proving any specific hypothesis. What I want is to understand what really happened. And so far, I don't think we have the answer. Uh, I published uh, several works related to this question. Oh, my screen has been cut, I think. What happened? No, it was okay, Jacques, it was okay. It was okay, yeah. Yeah, that looks okay. Good. Okay, is it okay like this? Yeah. Yep. So uh, I published several works uh, related to the questions. Uh, first, we wrote with several colleagues a review uh, where we really uh, analyzed uh, the data that was available at that time. And uh, we had really an open mind and we came to the conclusion that it was not possible to really have a, a conclusive uh, decision about whether the virus results from natural origin or uh, from uh, some 
research or lab-related uh, accidents. Uh, we also, I also co-signed for open letters to the WHO that were sent by a consortium of scientists and citizens and specialists of biosafety. Uh, we can discuss the reasons for that. And then very recently, on September 17, this year, uh, we had an appeal that was published in The Lancet, an appeal for an objective, open, and transparent scientific debate about the origins of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, this uh, letter actually was an answer to a paper published by Kalisha and colleagues, uh, which was the second open letter that they made. They, they published a letter in 2020, which was very influential, and then a second one uh, in 2021, where they uh, wrote under other things this sentence, we believe that the stronger clue from new, credible, and peer-reviewed evidence in the scientific literature is that the virus evolved in nature, while suggestion of a laboratory leak source of the pandemic remain without scientifically validated evidence that directly supports it in peer-reviewed scientific journals. I think I could agree with most of the sentence, but interestingly, it can be reversed because what we demonstrated in this paper is that currently there is no direct evidence for natural zoonosis either. And also what we showed is that a research related hypothesis is plausible. And so since we don't have any overwhelming evidence for either a zoonotic or research related origin, uh, we should consider that the jury is still out. Then more importantly, what we concluded is that scientific journals should open their columns to an in-depth analysis of all the plausible hypotheses. Uh, I will not de de deploy these arguments here. They were uh, written and published. What I would like to do now is to show uh, some highlight on the question based on very recent uh, publications. And I would like to address three points that are related to, to genomic sequence analysis, which is somehow my specialty. The so-called genomic backbone, the furin cleavage sites in the spike protein, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And then I would like to conclude with some thoughts about how uh, we should, as a scientific community, uh, try to do better. So uh, first about the genomic background, since the beginning, since uh, the beginning of 2020, a recurrent argument has been, if SARS-CoV-2 had been engineered, there should be a non-backbone. And by backbone here, uh, the people mean a very similar viral genome that could have served as starting point. And actually this argument is fallacious because scientists generally keep their sequence uh, inside the lab until they publish an article. And we have a, an obvious example of that. Uh, and this example is the famous uh, RATG13 uh, uh, genome. So this is a bad virus, which used to be the closest homologue to SARS-CoV-2. It was collected in a mine shaft in uh, 2013. A very short fragment was published in 16, and the full genome was sequenced in 18. It was analyzed by three PhD uh, students who published their thesis in 18 and 19, yet the full genome sequence was only published in January 2020. So uh, we cannot conclude that if a backbone was existing, we should have found it in uh, public databases. But also an important and interesting uh, uh, element is that you don't even need to have a backbone in order to have a synthetic viruses. And this also is demonstrated by the literature. In 2008, Baker and co-workers did uh, a computation of a, what they call a putative consensus uh, bat uh, cov sequence genome. And this is based on four the genomes that they had at that time. And they computed the most frequent letters at each position of these genomes. And this means that after that, you can synthesize a DNA molecule that is actually distant from each of the uh, original uh, genomes. And what they did is to synthesize such a DNA molecule. And from this, they generated a virus. And they showed that this virus is active, able to replicate, to infect cells, and to propagate. So by definition, such genomes have some person difference from each of the known genomes used to conceive them. An important uh, feature that was revealed uh, last week uh, is, is that uh, there is a diffuse a project that was deposited to the DARPA uh, agency. So it's an agency for uh, military uh, research, defense uh, related research in the US. And this project was deposed, uh, deposited in diffuse in 2018 and it includes a proposal to generate synthetic genomes based on consensus sequences from SARS-related coronaviruses. Diffuse was not funded, so it is not approved per se that this has been done, but it shows at least that these experiments were planned. Now, 
the other uh, element is the foreign cleavage site. And this is a key element to the specificity of uh, SARS-CoV-2 human infectivity. Indeed, uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 the way that makes uh, the high efficiency of the virus for entering into our cells by interacting with a receptor, a protein in our membranes, in the membranes of our cells. And actually, this is the only known uh, foreign site in all the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Both a natural and artificial origin are plausible. Why? Well, natural uh, origin is plausible because these things happen and you just can see uh, some alignment of uh, all the coronavirus genomes and you will see that there are many insertion events in some particular regions of the proteins uh, and of the spike protein. Now, uh, also it could have been designed and in particular in 2006, already people were using uh, for inside insertion in order to test the impact on the virus uh, infectivity. And there are at least 11 uh, publications that are using this technique, so it is well known. Also, uh, significantly or not, but at least uh, interestingly, the diffuse project proposed also to insert a furin cleavage site in the SARS-related viruses. So even though this project was not funded, it shows that this type of experiment are not only conceivable, but they were really planned to be done. Now, there is a game changer, what is being qualified as a game changer. It is that we have news about the receptor binding domain. So the receptor binding domain is this domain by which the, the virus binds to uh, the, the human cells. And until uh, very recently, we had no virus with a very close relationship to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RBD. So uh, there was, uh, if you look at the alignment and the, uh, at the similarity plot, you see that there is a drop of similarity in this region for all the bad viruses. Uh, and uh, there was one uh, exception to that. Uh, it was a pangolin uh, genome in green here that comes a bit closer to the SARS-CoV-2, but yet is quite, uh, quite uh, distant in this region. And what happened is that uh, this uh, month, there is a preprint that is under review currently where uh, the uh, people uh, from uh, Pasteur in Laos and in France characterized uh, several bat vi uh, viruses coming from North Laos. And what they showed is that actually those ones are similar with the SARS-CoV-2 over the full length of the genome, including in the RBD. So this is a great discovery. Uh, first of all, because this is now the closest non homologue It has 96.8% genome identity, whereas the previous one was 96.2. Also, it has the closest RBD. And importantly, they made experiments showing that this is able to directly, the virus is able to directly infect human cells. So this means that the intermediate host is not necessary anymore. Also, it is at a bat fly distance from Yunnan. So this means that similar genomes could have been found there. However, there are still a lot of missing information. In, in particular, we still don't have a furin cleavage site. It is absent from these genomes. And also we still miss 40 years of evolutionary divergence. And we also miss uh, 160,000, uh, 1,600 uh, kilometers pass I'm from Laos to Wuhan. So the last point, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm finished. I just would like to conclude. So for me, the state of the question is clearly that we don't have a definitive evidence for any of the hypotheses. There is a, a lot of missing data. And so this is why we called for a fact-based uh, debate among scientists. We know there are obstacles conflicts of interest, arguments of authority, corporatism, conformist, fear for political instrumentalization. All this has been discussed at length. It, it is understandable. I think it's our responsibility to overcome this. And for this, we should individually adopt the scientific attitude and remember how to do so. And it's an effort. We all have to do it. And also we should accept that contradiction is the essence of science. So I make a call and we made a call for scientific journals to open their columns. I also think, independently of that, that we need to revise the international regulation because irrespective of the origin of this virus, it is clear now that uh, several labs in the world are doing experiments that are of concern because they are generating uh, viruses that are potential pandemics. So I would like to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this. And I put a list here with not only the scientists, but also some citizens who really were very important in digging out the information and bringing it to the world, including sending it to the scientists for doing the analysis and uh, putting it in public. Thank you for your attention.
Right, that, thanks, Jack. Uh, so the, we're going to move on to the last um, um, uh, talk in this session, which will be from Jonathan Latham and uh, Alison Wilson. Uh, are going to talk about um, the, uh, the Mojang mine outbreak and the lab origin question. So, do we? Does everyone see my screen? Yeah. Great. So, hello everyone. Today, I've been asked to do two things. One is to declare my conflicts of interest on this opening slide. The second is to talk about lab origins and one hypothesis in particular which we call the Mojang minus passage theory. The word passage refers to the virological technique of moving a virus, usually between organisms, in order to progressively adapt it to a new host. Our theory proposes that an equivalent process happened inside the lungs of miners following a mystery disease outbreak in 2012. Before going further, I want to direct you to the articles noted on this slide. These contain specific details and scientific references to support the points covered in this talk. After a brief overview, I will present some analysis that is new and thus not fully elaborated in those links. I also want to be clear that there are other lab origin theories. The key distinction of the Mojang minor passage theory is that all other theories assume that the creation of SARS-2 by lab manipulation or viral passaging began with one or more bat viruses acquired in nature. The Mojang minor passage theory, in contrast, proposes that the virus leaked from a medical sample obtained from the miners affected by the outbreak. But first, why is a lab origin being considered for COVID-19? In short, because the world's leading center for bat coronavirus research is in Wuhan, and the closest known wild relative of SARS-2 came from a bat. Second, because the many zoonotic origin theories proposed today from frozen, frozen fish to pangolin intermediates are not supported by science significant evidence. This slide lists some key questions to be answered by any origin theory. So we need to know why did the virus break out in Wuhan? Why was there only one spillover event, which is a single spillover event is a, considered to be a red flag for lab origin. Why was the initial virus so well adapted to humans? How did it acquire a furin cleavage site? Why has no intermediate animal host been found? But most specifically, I want to just raise the questions uh, brought out by Jacques too, which are why did, uh, when the, the closest known rel wild relative of SARS-2 was published, why did the authors not mention that they have been researching this virus ever since they found it in 2013? Why also did they fail to mention that this virus was found at the site of a suspected coronavirus outbreak? And why also did they rename that virus? So, so these uh, uh, puzzling activities indicate to us that there was a concerted attempt to hide connections between SARS-2, RATG-13, and the mine outbreak. So the specifics of the theory that, that uh, we have proposed are that it was known that in April 2012, three miners died and three others became ill in a mysterious disease outbreak at the Mojang copper mine in Yunnan, China. And these miners were shoveling bat guano. So there was a clear link to, to bats in this uh, epidemic. All six miners had COVID-like symptoms and were diagnosed tentatively with an unknown coronavirus. We also know from subsequent sampling that bat coronaviruses were diverse and abundant in and near the mine. We also know that these miners, some of the miners, underwent a lengthy hospitalization and treatment. So this treatment lasted, uh, this, this, this period lasted up to about six months, the two of them. And our proposal is that this hospitalization allowed the evolution of a novel adapted human coronavirus. We also know that many samples were taken from the miners and medical samples, and some were sent to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So the big question is what was in the samples and what was done with any viruses that were found? So 
we need to understand the importance of these samples. There was intense interest in China in this outbreak. And there was also the possibility that coronaviruses found there would validate the entire research program of Chinese virology and the Wuhan Institute of Virology in particular. So the natural course of events would have been to take these viruses, to sequence them, to clone them, and to culture them. And our proposal is that in that process of doing that, one escaped and led to the pandemic. Now, I want to address a part of the theory that, uh, that we have, uh, that some people have had difficulty with, but which is of strong practical medical interest. So the minor passage theory requires that many hundreds of mutations arose inside the body of a single hospitalized minor, thereby converting a related wild bat virus into SARS-2, i.e. decades of normal coronavirus evolution were crammed into about six months. Is that possible? In a previous BMJ COVID Unknowns webinar, a new viral variant, Professor Gupta of Cambridge University discuss the surprising phenomenon shown in this slide of isolated cases of greatly accelerated evolution. This slide plots the sampling date of UK viruses against their divergence from Wuhan HU1, the first published SARS-2 sequence. The lower line just shows viruses in Britain evolving over time to become progressively more different from the Wuhan strain. But in September, there occurred a sudden evolutionary jump of 23 mutations to the upper line, which then reverts to the original trajectory. From then on, the B117 lineage formed in the jump becomes more numerous, displacing the viruses in the lower slope. The accepted explanation for this dramatic evolutionary leap is that B117 arose entirely within a solitary, probably immunocompromised individual who had an extended infection before transmitting it. The key observation is that as much evolution occurred in that individual as had occurred in the literally millions of infections in the rest of the country since the pandemic began. How could that happen? Professor Gupta noted that the patients he studied and who also exhibited very rapid bursts of evolution were immunocompromised, but that is surely not the full story. What needs to be appreciated about individuals who harbor COVID-19 for a long period is that they accumulate a large diversity of viruses. This is in contrast to typical infections. Normally, cases acquire from their contact a very small number of similar or identical viruses and pass on an identical or similar or near identical virus within a few days. Thus, infected individuals accumulate limited genetic diversity and pass on hardly any of this. Consequently, every five or so days, the virus passes through a severe genetic bottleneck. The same is not true for patients harboring the virus for long periods. In them, genetic diversity builds and builds. What we further know is that coronaviruses recombine very frequently i.e. multiple times in every infected cell. What that means for virus evolution is that when adaptive mutations arise, although they arise independently in different viral genomes, recombination lets them combine into a single genome. Recombination thus explains how the 23 mutations in B117 came together in one virus. So while recombination also occurs in ordinary infections, because viral diversity is limited, its evolutionary consequences are slight. Thus, only in long-term infections does high diversity synergize with recombination to accelerate virus evolution in an exponential fashion. One additional factor needs to be considered. Successful and significant viral mutations rarely arise alone. Rather, adaptive mutations are usually synergistic or compensatory with other mutations, meaning at least two mutations must arise approximately simultaneously. This is because proteins, like the COVID uh, spike protein, are three-dimensional structures. So changes arising in one position are often only adaptive if they occur simultaneously with changes occurring elsewhere in the protein or even the virus. 
some of these new variants show this tendency for cooperativity very clearly. The B1427 California variant of concern, for example, is characterized by two mutations, S13I and W152C, that are found in a region of the spike called the N-terminal domain. In the Wuhan strain, these two amino acids act independently. But in B1427, when both mutations are present together, a covalent chemical bond forms that remodels the whole end terminal to resist the binding of antibodies. But only when viral diversity is high, as in long-term patients, is it likely that recombination will bring together mutations in pairs or in novel clusters to create successful novel forms and new variants. All of this has practical medical implications. Doctors need to be aware that immunocompromised long-term COVID patients present special dangers. The implication for our Mojang minus Passage theory is that these instances of hyperevolution make it far easier to see how decades of evolution can be telescoped into an extended hospital stay of a single immunocompromised minor, especially when we consider that the minors were infected with the bat virus and zoonotic jumps are known to independently accelerate viral evolution. We therefore share the Mojang minor passage theory because it provides biologically plausible answers to all the questions I posed earlier. And I will end with this slide, which indicates some key remaining questions and where we think crucial data may yet come from. So I'll close there and thank you very much all for your attention. Uh, attention. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I'm going to hand uh, over. I'm going to hand over to Alison uh, Pollock to chair the uh, next session as we're, we're running a little bit uh, behind time. Thank you. That was a great first session. And I'm going to go, for want of time, going straight into the second session. And we've got Angela Rasmussen. And she's going to talk about uh, gain of function research, what it is, and uh, safety and governance aspects. Thanks, Angela. Uh, thank you. I, I may need um, Dr. Latham to stop sharing his screen. Yeah. Uh, OK. Personally, though. Uh... Are you on your, I don't think you're on your slide yet. Um, yeah, I think that there may have been an issue with us um, okay. swapping screen shares uh, at the same time. So, okay, oh, is this, um, okay, yeah. perfect. And if you could go on to full presentation onto this, yeah, lovely, wonderful. Okay, got it. All right, so I'm Angie Rasmussen. I work and live on Treaty 6 territory on the unceded homelands of the Métis people here in beautiful Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, and I'm going to be talking today about gain of function research. So very quickly, um, here are my disclosures and contact information. I've been very comprehensive in all of my disclosures, but I draw your attention to my on topic priors. And that is that I've authored three uh, pieces about this particular topic. Um, most recently, a peer reviewed critical review of the topic, um, examining all of the scientific evidence in cell. Um, and I'm just gonna dive right in. So for gain of function, um, people talk about gain of function meaning one thing, but it actually means a lot of really different things uh, because context here is really important. So gain of function is actually a really estab well-established concept from genetics. Um, there are also lots of function mutations. And basically what these mean is that a particular gene uh, or genetic feature um, can either confers a new function uh, to that gene or protein um, or virus. In this case, that would be gain of function or it takes it away. That would be a loss of function or a null mutation. So gain of function can really mean a lot of things. And the example I have here about cancer and mutations that lead to, to cancer, um, a gain of function in a particular growth factor that's associated with oncogenesis, for example, could result in excessive cell proliferation or metastasis. Um, this has nothing to do with viral replication or transmissibility or virulence, um, but it's just to really make the point that gain of function can mean a lot of different things. So what I'm going to talk today about is the gain of function that's not only particular to virology, 
but also that, that really is important to regulate and to perform safely. So in virology, there can also be a lot of different kinds of gain of function experiments. And here's just two examples. Uh, viral vectored vaccines are technically gain of function experiments. And the adenovirus vectored vaccines, such as the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, um, we have the gene for SARS coronavirus 2 spike inserted into the adenoviral genome. Um, it, it expresses spike. That's not something that adenoviruses normally do. That's a gain of function. The same is true for vesicular stomatitis virus vector vaccines in which the glycoprotein on the surface of the virus particle is replaced with the glycoprotein from other viruses. And this particular vaccine here for Ebola virus has actually been approved by the FDA and is a really crucial tool uh, for how we address Ebola outbreaks um, currently. So this is just to show that there's a lot of different kinds of gain of function, even within virology experiments. And obviously this is not the kind of thing that, that causes us concern either. So what is? Um, that's when gain of function experiments are a type of what's called DERC or dual use research of concern. Um, the US government has a very long wordy definition but it essentially says uh, the same thing that the WHO definition is of DERC and that's that it's research that has clear benefit um, but could also be misapplied to do harm. So uh, a study to look at what makes a virus transmissible to a human uh, or makes it uh, capable of infecting a human cell um, would be very beneficial in terms of informing us about a particular pathogen's risk, um, but it also could be misapplied by somebody who would take that virus then uh, and potentially use it as a biological weapon or um, for some other nefarious purpose. So that's, uh, that's the kind of gain of function research that we're talking about here, it's DERC. And a little bit of history on how this has been regulated and how it's been sort of uh, referred to in the public consciousness um, really goes back to 2014 and these two separate experiments, um, both of which use serial passage and site-directed mutagenesis to look at uh, what would make highly pathogenic H5N1 avian influenza more transmissible in a ferret model. Um, now this caused a lot of consternation when it came out because the thing with H5N1 is it's very lethal. Uh, however, it's not very easily transmitted from person to person. So the concern in these experiments, which were selecting for H5N1 viruses that could be efficiently transmitted by the aerosol route between ferrets, uh, caused people to think that if it's being transmitted this way in ferrets, then maybe it could be transmitted this way in people and we could have a potential H5N1 pandemic on our hands. And so after a lot of discussion, uh, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity recommended a three-year moratorium on gain-of-function work in the U.S. And this was actually both good and bad. Um, it was good in the sense that it allowed people to take a step back and start thinking about how this could be better regulated. Um, it also was bad, though, in the sense that early on during the moratorium, it really hampered a lot of influenza virus research, some of which was very important for developing flu vaccines. Um, so this you know, regulation has its benefits, it also has its drawbacks. So that's why this whole, uh, this whole enterprise has to be done with a, a real serious concern for balancing the risks and benefits of doing this research versus not. Um, now, I just like to point out that it wasn't that there was no regulation whatsoever about these viruses, uh, especially very dangerous viruses prior to this moratorium happening. Um, the select agent regulations occurred after the 2001 anthrax attacks, and uh, there's a whole list of these pathogens that are considered select agents and toxins by the CDC and by the USDA. And I would just point out here that the SARS coronavirus classic is on this list. Now, I'd also point out that the select agent program is not just lip service. This is federal law, and there, there are potentially criminal penalties for violating this law. Also select agent regulations mean that any lab that's working with select agents, and in the case of SARS coronavirus, it's a positive sense RNA virus, which means that the RNA can actually be infectious. So anybody working with SARS genomes, not even the infectious virus, is going to be subject to these regulations. There are annual inspections for every lab uh, that, that is doing this, including the high containment lab, including maximum containment labs, BSL-4 labs. Um, and Invariably, every year there are always uh, violations that are found during these inspections. And some of them are more serious than others, but I'd point out that every year the select agent program does notify the, the FBI of any security, 
security related uh, issue with a select agent. Um, and these are often really minor things. It, it can be losing a vial, that's what 12 notifications were for, a virus. It can be uh, discovering the select agent outside of the registered space, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's outside of containment, but it might be outside the room that it's supposed to be working, you know, that you're supposed to be working with it in. And there were two notifications concerning an unsecured incubator key box. That basically just means that somebody forgot to lock the select agent incubator. Um, none of these are actually containment breaches, but it is taken so seriously that the law enforcement apparatuses are called in to investigate these things. So the, the select agent biosecurity that existed um, was already quite robust and would have been involved in regulating these H5N1 experiments that were just described. Now I would point out too, that in the select agent law, there are some restricted experiments that, that classify a, a subset of gain of function experiments. And that's um, experiments where you would be inserting a gene for drug or vaccine resistance into a select agent. So this um, was a partial way of regulating and keeping an eye on potential gain of function experiments of concern, um, but obviously it doesn't include all of these things and it only applies to select agents. So uh, that's why the P3CO framework was, was developed. And this is the potential pandemic pathogen care and oversight framework. This is a guideline, a set of guidelines for making funding decisions as well as oversight decisions about proposed research that might involve enhanced potential pandemic pathogens. And that is important because that's basically the definition of a gain of function experiment that's used by the US government to regulate these. And what that means is that an enhanced P3 is defined as a potential pandemic pathogen that results from enhancing the transmissibility or virulence of that pathogen in people. Uh, so, and that's, that's based on the P3 definition here above. This is specific to viruses that would cause increased transmissibility or virulence in humans. And that's really important because uh, a lot of the, the experiments that are being described as gain of function often don't actually result uh, in enhancement of transmissibility or virulence in humans. They might result in enhancement of that in mice, uh, in a model system, but that doesn't mean that they're going to uh, result in an enhanced uh, P3 in people. And that's what really is relevant to uh, the, the federal government and the US's regulation of this. So I would point out too, that the vast, vast majority of virology experiments do not create or involve enhanced P3. This is a very small subset of all the virology experiments that are done, even the ones that are being done with potential pandemic pathogens. So I just wanna go over as I end here on the multiple layers of oversight that there actually are. So there are multiple steps in how the US government regulates uh, dual use life sciences research. Um, and it all starts with the PI. Now I've heard a lot of things that virologists aren't really paying very close attention to biosafety, which is just simply not true at the very least because none of us wanna get infected with the potential pandemic pathogens we're working with. But most of us I think are, are fairly ethical people as well. And so we do put a lot of thought into biosafety and biosecurity before we ever embark on an experiment with a dangerous uh, infectious pathogen. So this is really at the level of individual scientists, but this is only the beginning. The, the level of oversight does not end with a PI deciding whether or not their experiment is safe or not. Um, there's <laughs> also an institutional layer of regulation um, that uh, is done by the biosafety committees, the DERC committees, animal care and use committees, and the medical surveillance programs. Uh, within the institution, and then finally at the governmental level. So the, the various government agencies, including the P3CO uh, panels that have been convened, are all involved in regulating this type of research. Now there is a problem in that the P3CO evaluation process is not particularly transparent. And that's something that I'd just like to end on um, in saying that we could improve that. But first I'd just like to summarize the risks and benefits of doing this. So the risks of researching these potential pandemic pathogens include things like a laboratory accident causing an outbreak or impacting workers. But these risks can largely be mitigated with good biosafety and biosecurity practices. The benefits of not researching them is a lower risk of these laboratory origin outbreaks. And really there's only been one pandemic that's ever been associated with a laboratory origin. Um, on the contrary, uh, a number of zoonosis pandemics have occurred, basically all the rest of the pandemics that have occurred. 
So there are huge risks to also not researching these pathogens. We, it, it allows us to unable accurately assess the risk of emergent human pathogens. It provides us an incomplete understanding of these viruses and how they work. It inhibits our ability to develop effective countermeasures and it increases global vulnerability to emerging novel pathogens. Uh, these risks cannot be mitigated because there's often no substitute for just doing a pathogenesis experiment and finding out how this all works. Um, and we really need that in order to develop preemptive countermeasures like drugs and vaccines in order to do better surveillance, in order to keep us better prepared, and ultimately to keep us all safer from these novel emergent pathogens. Angela, so some you, things, no, Thanks. I'm wrapping it up and uh, I will just leave these myths and reality here. You can come back and look at my slides on YouTube and see what I had to say about it. But my suggestions for improvement as I wrap this up is that uh, we need to have international consensus for best practices. We need to have increased transparency and we do need to come up with some way to have international oversight mechanisms for all dual use research uh, because doing this research is really important and it's important that we can all feel confident that it's safe. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Angela. Um, we're going to move straight on now to Alison Young who's going to talk about uh, lab leaks um, and also cover safety and governance issues as well. Thanks, Alison. Thank you. All right. Are you guys seeing my screen? We're seeing you. Okay, you're not seeing my screen. Okay. Try this again. It started screen sharing. I did. Are yep. you seeing now? We're on now. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to speak here. Um, as a journalist, I have spent more than 10 years reporting on laboratory accidents in the United States. I've been asked to talk a bit about the kinds of lab accidents that have occurred, how frequently accidents happen, and also a bit about the oversight of biological research facilities. Because my reporting has focused on lab accidents in the United States, that is going to be the focus of my presentation. The kinds of accidents that are occurring in the United States provide a window into potential biosafety issues in labs around the world. Now it will not let me advance. Hang on a second here. There we go. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, but like the other speakers, I do want to um, just talk a little bit about where I'm coming from on the issue of COVID's origins. Um, and that is in my work as a journalist. Um, I don't have an opinion on the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic, other than that based on my years of reporting on lab accidents, the so-called lab leak theory shouldn't be dismissed without independent investigation. Since the pandemic began, legitimate questions about whether a lab accident in Wuhan could have played a role in the origin of COVID-19 has been branded as a conspiracy theory. It has only been in recent months that a lab accident along with natural spillover started being viewed as a plausible theory. One of the reasons it has taken so long is that influential scientific groups like the joint WHO China study group have dismissed the lab accident theory as quote, extremely unlikely without doing an in-depth investigation. Part of the stated reason is the notion that it's unlikely that pathogens could escape from a high containment lab facility like the Wuhan Institute of Virology that, and that lab accidents are extremely rare events. This was something that was made clear by one of the panel's leads even before their report was finished being written. While publicly available data on lab accidents in the United States and around the world is limited, it's very clear that lab accidents are not rare. Last year in the United States alone, there were 134 reported laboratory exposure incidents involving just a subset of pathogens that are called select agents. These are viruses, bacteria, and toxins that the US government regulates because they pose a significant threat to public health or agriculture, or they have the potential to be used in bioterrorism. These are things like anthrax, Ebola, deadly strains of avian influenza, and SARS-associated coronaviruses. In each of these 134 incidents, the details of which the US government does not disclose beyond aggregate numbers, there was an occupational exposure to one of these pathogens. Uh, 
The good news is only one illness was reported last year in this subset of labs working with a subset of pathogens. Lab accidents, incidents, and potential exposures happen frequently. What's rare are incidents that have caused documented illnesses and outbreaks, but those have happened with significant consequences. And in many cases, accidents went unrecognized until after illnesses or outbreaks had already occurred. So here are some examples. In 2007, at an animal health research and vaccine facility in Purebright, a leaking drainage pipe was determined to be the likely source of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease on some nearby farms. 600 cattle had to be culled to stop the outbreak. This lab accident was actually a literal lab leak, uh, where it is believed that poorly maintained drains released the virus into the surrounding environment, spreading to nearby farms on the muddy wheels of vehicles. Linking this outbreak to the lab was helped by the unique strain of the virus. The strain was one from a 1967 foot and mouth disease epidemic. It's a strain that was not known to be circulating anywhere in the world, but it was known to be used in laboratories and in vaccine manufacturing. As was mentioned by the previous speaker, there was a global epidemic in 1977, 1978, that is widely viewed to have been from a non-natural origin. The strain was one that appeared to be largely unchanged from one that circulated in 1950. The leading theories are that it somehow either escaped a lab or emerged as a result of a vaccine trial mishap. When it comes to SARS coronaviruses, there have been multiple infections um, and an outbreak um, associated with laboratories. After the first SARS epidemic was contained in the summer of 2003, a series of lab accidents threatened to reignite new outbreaks. First, there was a lab accident in Singapore where a grad student working with West Nile virus became infected with SARS. Cross-contamination in the lab was suspected. Then there was a lab incident in Taiwan where another researcher was infected, possibly while cleaning up some liquid waste. And then a third incident occurred a few months later at a lab in Beijing. Two grad student researchers became infected and they were among a small outbreak of nine cases. The mother of one of the grad students died. At the time, the WHO warned of the risks posed by specimens of SARS virus being kept in labs around the world and the importance of good biosafety practices. There are many ways that lab accidents can potentially result in an infection or a release. Many involve mishaps that are obvious to the lab worker at the time that they occur, such as an animal bite or a needle stick allowing actions to be taken to prevent the infection or the spread of disease. There are many layers of safeguards in use in biological research laboratories. Laboratories operate at one of four biosafety levels. Those that work with the most dangerous pathogens are supposed to occur at the two highest levels, biosafety level three and biosafety level four um, that have a high degree of equipment. And, um, but equipment can fail and safety procedures are not always followed, even in the best of labs. Human error is always a potential factor. Here are some examples of how things can go wrong and how lab personnel can be unaware an accident has occurred until an infection or an outbreak happens. In 2014, 86 workers at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Atlanta headquarters were potentially exposed to live anthrax because of a procedure that was used in one of its labs did not fully inactivate the samples. These samples were sent to a lower safety level lab where workers assumed they didn't need to use key safety equipment because the specimens had been certified as safe. A similar incident occurred, but over the course of nearly 10 years, um, with a U.S. Army lab in Utah, um, these, these specimens ended up being sent to nearly 200 labs all over the United States and in at least nine countries. And it's particularly noteworthy that this particular lab had already been cited for this issue by federal regulators in the select agent program in 2007, yet the problems were allowed to continue for years. Cross-contamination is another sort of issue that's important in this area. In 2014, a CDC lab sent a sample of what was supposed to be a benign flu strain for use in a vaccine efficacy study at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
It put workers and the experiment at the other lab at risk. It was only after chickens in the study unexpectedly died that the release of the dangerous flu strain was discovered. Waste disposal. Um, and I already have, have shared the example of what happened in Peerbright. Um, the US Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland has been cited for multiple issues related to its wastewater treatment. In 2018, storms flooded the lab complex's wastewater steam sterilization plant, forcing the lab to instead start using a chemical waste decontamination process. But regulators forced the shutdown after determining that the new decontamination procedures were not consistently followed. The Army has said that there has never been any threat to the public. In 2015, our USA Today team published an investigation of the safety of high containment biosafety level three and level four labs across the United States. We revealed that hundreds of lab mistakes, incidents, and accidents have occurred. And our investigation found that oversight of biological research labs is fragmented, often secretive, and largely self-policing. And it is a finding that has also been echoed in reports by the US Government Accountability Office over the years. It's impossible to get a complete count of lab accidents and lab acquired infections in the United States because there's no universal mandatory requirement for reporting them. And unless a lab is experimenting with regulated select agent pathogens, much of the oversight and inspection of US labs is left up to each research institution's internal biosafety committee and staff. These are some of the areas, but there are largely guidelines in place. I would echo the concerns about a lack of transparency when it comes to this kind of research in labs. Regardless of the country, laboratories do not enjoy making their lab accidents public. Even in the United States where laws and rules require records be released, some labs ignore information requests or attempt to charge hundreds of dollars for records. And when you finally get them, they end up looking like Swiss cheese. It's important to note that there is no strong institutional advocate for transparency about lab safety, uh, lab safety issues and accidents. It's worth also pointing out that the major US government agencies involved in laboratory oversight are not truly independent watchdogs. These agencies also operate their own laboratories and research programs where they have their own lab accidents and they are often funding the research and the external labs that they oversee. I would just lastly say that this issue goes beyond the current question of the lab leak hypothesis and into the larger issues of these kinds of labs as well. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Alison. Um, that was very clear. If we can move on now to Johanna Lindell, who's going to talk about um, wet markets, what they are, their safety and governance. Thanks, Johanna. Thank you. Great. Now, I'm trying to get the screen to share properly. So, the topic of today for me no, is... You're not quite on... Um, um, no, I am. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about vet markets and the different things that regulate them in different countries and why they can contribute to disease spread, but also why they are difficult to ban. So we know that there is a lot of ways that zoonotic diseases can spread from the animals. And there's a lot of different networks in the environment, which also includes the vet markets. So what are really the vet markets? Well, they're called vet markets because there's usually a quite a lot of water involved, keeping fish or uh, keeping water running to keep products wet and fresh. In difference to dry markets, which are usually cereals or other crops that don't require much water to keep them wet. So that's one distinction, but there are often markets that have both components. All markets don't have live animals. There are some markets that are specialized in having live animals for sale. There are also markets where you have one part of the market for live animals or where they're interspersed among other products. And when it comes to live animals, they could be wild animals or domestic animals. And in many cases, it's not very consistent. Some markets may have wild animals one day, depending on if they have been caught or there could be wild animals present most of the days. And among the wild animals, we also have some exotic species where there in most countries are trade bans in selling wild caught protected species. 
But it's also wild animals that we sometimes don't think about, like rats, rodents, pigeons that are wild caught, but not really considered a wild animal to be protected. In addition to the animals that are sold and the animal products, there is often also a lot of food that people can consume at a place. In this case, a bunch of chili insects or blood meals being pre prepared directly from the chicken. And often you can consume them directly as you are, as you're walking around the market. There are formal markets as well in most countries. And depending on the culture or, or the country, there might be a dominance of formal markets or a dominance of the informal markets. But many vet markets aren't really properly informal. You will have an inspection system, a registration system. In this case, on the right picture, there are inspectors that are actually taking photos. So there are many countries that have a regulatory system for these live animals or the vet markets. But even in the case when there are properly certified markets, there are often also in the countryside smaller markets, which are more difficult to control. So wet markets and live animal markets can be large and contain all sorts of uh, products, but it can also be a backyard uh, phenomenon of every village having their own market and selling the products that are available at the time. So there are reasons why there are wet markets, and a lot of them is about accessibility and affordability. When you don't have formal supermarkets everywhere, then you do need another market to supply the food. Also the affordability. In the kind of informal markets where you don't have packaged food, it's possible for people that don't have so much cash to buy exactly the amount of product that you can afford. It's also a matter of culture. If you're used to fresh meat being warm and recently slaughtered, then you don't want to go to a supermarket and buy cold meat where you don't know how long this animal has been dead. It's also rather cultural that you might want to see the animal alive and even might be bring it home alive so that you can slaughter it yourself. And then you know that the animal wasn't showing signs of disease and you know that it was fresh up until the moment it was killed. So there's a lot of services and credits also available for the customers that are coming a lot. And there's a benefits that these markets don't need so much cars for transporting. They don't need so many freezers. They don't need electricity. And people do like the freshness of these products. Similarly, the infrastructure is often built around these markets and not around the access to roads or large supermarkets. So where are the wet markets? Well, basically most of them are where the most people are. And there's why we see a lot of wet markets in South and Southeast Asia, where you have a rather high population density. And also of course, in many areas of tropical Africa, as well as the Americas. But there's also similarly to where we have a lot of people, we also have a lot of livestock and a lot of poor livestock keepers. So in addition to the 7 million pe billion people we have, we have around 37 billion livestock, and most of them are in low and middle income countries. And people are economically depending on these, and a lot of them are actually also in urban cities. And these animals are there to feed the half of the world population that are in cities. And this urban livestock keeping is pretty important for actually producing food. And this means also that urban animals are brought from the uh, countrysides. If they're not raised in the cities, they are brought and transported to the cities and maybe slaughtered as you can see in the slaughterhouse in the right picture. Where the then after the sun comes up will be shipped to the local wet market. So there's a large problem in many places to actually supply uh, products from the rural areas. And that's why you need to send live animals that can be sold live or recently slaughtered because you don't really have the access to a cold chain. 
There's also good benefits of actually having animals in the cities because then you can use urban waste and wastewater, but you do have a problem with lacking sanitation and many animals are actually scavenging around garbage. We know there's a risk of spillover events wherever we have wildlife, livestock and humans in the same interface where we interact and diseases can spill over. And that is kind of the situation we have in the markets, which are kind of a hotspot for diseases. We have people, we have the retailers and the customers, and also increasingly number of tourists actually go into these kind of markets for sightseeing. You have all the wild and domestic animals that are brought there for sale. You have all the animal source foods also ready-made. And then of course you have all the scavengers and the wildlife that we don't want in the market, such as the rats, the dogs, the bats at night time. And here's, here, of course, we can all see the risks of some kind of disease spreading across species. And that has been shown for avian influenza, where there has been you know, cases where you can actually go in the market and find avian influenza virus through air samples. And there has been a lot of human cases that are directly connected to the markets. For coronaviruses, well, the evidence is not that clear. I didn't have a good photo there. So it's me in Wuhan eating food. Uh, but we do know that a lot of cases have been connected with this market at, and that animals sold in the market are carrying different coronaviruses. So we don't have really the evidence here, but it is definitely not impossible. So when we have been looking at food safety as well, we all have a lot of these endemic pathogens such as for, over 40% of meat samples in Cambodia being positive for salmonella. And we know that we can't modernize our way to food safety because supermarketization is slower than we had planned. The formal sector food is not always safer. And there's a lot of problems sometimes for all these cooperatives. In this comparison, you can see that supermarkets actually had a higher proportion of meat samples that were unacceptable from a quality point of view. So the future of vet markets depends a lot on the legal aspects, the culture and the access for the poor. And here we do have a trade-off between people having to consider the food access today and the risk of a disease emergence tomorrow. And that is not an easy trade-off policymakers to do. So thank you for me. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Johanna. Um, we're going to move straight on to uh, Dillis Rowe now and Tian Ming Li, who are going to talk about um, our Dillis is on wildlife trade and cover, again, safety and um, governance issues. Thanks, Dillis. Great. Uh, many thanks, Alison. Let me just find my information. That's great. If you just go on to the full screen. Yeah, sorry. The uh, Maybe down at the bottom right, just before okay. you, you'll find um, on the bottom right. Okay. Yep, great. Mm. Great. So, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for the invite to participate in this. Um, my name is Dillis Rowe, and I work for the International Institute for Environment and Development, which is a sustainable development think tank based in, in London. Uh, so I'm not a virologist or an epidemiologist or, or any kind of ologist, I'm a social scientist. and coming at this very much from a sort of social and political science perspective. And I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my colleague, Tian Ming Li, who's a professor in the School of Life Science at Sun Yat-sen University in China. So uh, we, do we declare no conflict of interest? Um, and just to note that uh, my presentation today is largely based on a comment piece that uh, we had published in Nature Sustainability um, in January this year, but also drawing on um, other more recently published uh, pieces around the same issue. And just in terms of full disclosure, to note that um, uh, my work uh, is very much focused on the social impacts of conservation, policy, and as well as my role at IIED, I also chair a specialist group within the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and that specialist group specifically focuses on sustainable use of wildlife and its link to local people's livelihoods. 
So that's just to give you my background and the perspective with which um, I'm approaching this debate about the origins of COVID-19. So uh, as um, many, uh, as we all know, um, following the outbreak of COVID-19, wildlife trade was put in the spotlight and pretty much um, held up to blame for the outbreak. Um, many um, international and, and local conservation and animal rights organizations let out loud calls to ban wildlife trade um, as a result of COVID-19 and in order to prevent future pandemics. So you can see various slogans um, and, and campaign materials that were put out there. Um, and so this ranged from banning all wildlife trade to banning trade and consumption of certain species and certain types, um, and was largely um, based on health grounds, grounded in, in the need to prevent future pandemics, but actually quite often coming from some organizations that were wanting to ban wildlife trade well prior to the outbreak of COVID-19. So it, it's provided additional ammunition for calls to, to, to close down uh, this use um, and marketing of wildlife. Um, trade in wildlife is already uh, regulated under a UN convention, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, and that actually prohibits trade in many species that are endangered. So it's very much a conservation treaty and based on the endangerment of those species. It doesn't have a human health dimension to it. Um, the calls to ban wildlife trade were based um, on the assumption that COVID-19 originated from an animal with different sources pointing to uh, pangolins, civet cats um, and, and bats. Uh, and as a result of this, China um, did ban the consumption and trade of wild meat, uh, both from court sources and farm sources, although with a number of exceptions for farm species, and Vietnam also banned in July 2020 the import of wild species um, and, and markets in those wild species. So what do we know about uh, the link between zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 and wildlife trade? Well, we do know that the virus that causes COVID-19 in humans is related to another virus that's found in horseshoe bats. And we do know that horseshoe bats are caught, traded and consumed. So there is a correlation there. We think COVID-19 is a disease of zoonotic origin, but uh, the, the, the variety that's affected humans and the variety that's affected bats may have evolved independently from each other for decades, or as we've already discussed in this webinar, they may, may be of laboratory origin. Uh, I've been involved in the steering committee of um, a, um, a situation analysis to explore the evidence for the links between wildlife trade um, and, and human disease. Uh, that's coming out soon uh, to be published by IUCN, but preliminary findings were highlighted at the World Conservation Congress last month. And just a few highlights from that, trawling through the scientific literature uh, through a systematic review out of over 5,000 scientific articles that were explored and that discuss wildlife trade and its link to human diseases, only 3% of them mention at least one case of a human disease in the context of wildlife use and trade. So as other speakers have already pointed out, the evidence base is actually incredibly thin and patchy. Nevertheless, we know that the risk of novel pathogen spillover from wildlife trade is definitely not zero, so we do need to take it seriously, and even single events can have really serious consequences as we've seen from COVID-19. We also know that some species and some taxa are riskier than others in terms of potential for spill. So particularly birds, bats, primates and rodents. And we also know that some practices that you encounter in wildlife trade are more likely to lead to a spillover event. So these include overcrowded and stressful conditions, uh, species mixing where they wouldn't normally meet each other in natural situations, and mixing between wild and domestic animals. And all of these occur in, in the context of wildlife trade. So it's definitely something that we need to take seriously uh, and certainly improve the governance and regulation of and the biosecurity aspects of um, in, in terms of pandemic prevention. However, we also need to think about positive 
potential negative consequences of, of banning wildlife trade. If we were to follow that policy prescription that so many conservation and animal rights organizations are asking for. So first of all, one negative consequence is on food security. So wild meat consumption is often seen as a niche and slightly backward um, practice that only occurs in, in far-flung countries, but it's actually consumed globally um, in North America, Europe, as well as developing countries. But in developing countries, it makes an absolutely critical contribution to the food security of millions of rural people, particularly indigenous peoples and local communities. And the opportunities for appropriate substitutes for that meat and that protein source are often very limited. Livelihoods, wildlife trade is a source of income for millions of people. Again, this is global, but it's particularly important as an income source for rural people in developing countries. Conservation, the income generated from wildlife trade provides a strong incentive for the conservation of species in the wild and for the conservation of their habitat. And then domestic livestock production. So globally, as I said, a lot of wild meat is consumed. Much of this is undocumented. It occurs in the informal sectors uh, in Latin America, Africa and Asia. But even where it's documented and recorded, it's over 2 million tonnes per year. So removing this source of meat is likely to stimulate a shift to increased domestic meat production and consumption. And that is likely to have further negative consequences and feedback loops. So this is um, uh, a, a, a visual abstract from a paper published recently by Holly Booz et al from Oxford University that looks at the potential risk if we take wild meat out of food systems. And it identifies that food insecurity could massively increase for at least 15 high risk countries. And equally, biodiversity loss could also massively increase for 10 high-risk countries. And the biodiversity loss is driven by the fact that we would need extra agricultural land to replace the wildlife that's being consumed and extra livestock. And that would account to over 120,000 kilometers squared of extra land. And this land use could drive um, uh, over 200 species towards extinction globally. So potentially significant negative impacts on conservation. Uh, and there's, there's, there are more negative consequences thinking about that. So the less that wildlife is traded and consumed, the more livestock we have, the more livestock trade, the more zoonotic risk. So evidence from our situation analysis uh, conducted by IUCN showed that you're more likely, more, 3000 times more likely to contract a zoonosis from a domestic animal than from a wild animal based on trade volume estimates. Similarly, more livestock means more habitat conversion, which also means more zoonotic risk. So recent global assessments of the state of nature, all published this year, point to land conversion for industrialized agriculture, including livestock production, being a key driver, both of biodiversity loss um, and also of the emergence of infectious diseases. So it's ecosystem changes like deforestation, land clearance, and, and other forms of habitat change, which massively increase the interaction between humans and wildlife and between livestock and wildlife, and therefore facilitate the transmission of infectious diseases. So some quick conclusions. Wildlife trade may have been the catalyst for COVID-19 for the outbreak, but there are more unknowns than there are knowns. And if we just focus on wildlife trade as our policy prescription for dealing with COVID-19, it's really a simplistic solution that masks the far more politically contentious reforms that are really needed. So that includes radical transformation of our global food system, one that's currently characterized by intensive livestock, large areas of land producing food for that livestock. It means a shift away from the commodity supply chains that currently characterize our global economic system that encourage deforestation. And it also means dietary shifts away from meat. And that's not just wild meat, that's all meat. So just, I want to conclude on the point that infected wild meat and wildlife trade are potential symptoms of zoonotic spillover. But we really need to focus attention on tackling the causes rather than treating the symptoms if we're going to avoid these unintended consequences, but also prevent future pandemics. 
So tackling the causes is paying attention to our impact on land and on nature and our food systems, not de dealing with individual sources such as wildlife trade and specific wet markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dillis. Lots of food for thought there, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, thank you. Um, moving straight on now to Jose Frutos, who's going to talk about um, shift, changing the paradigm to the circulation model um, and studies of, of, um, of circulating animal coronaviruses. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Alison. Um, let me try to, okay. Can you see the slides? Uh, yep, we can. Now you just need to go on to... Um... Okay, yep. very good. Um, so just to... to um, to, to start with, um, I have no conflict of interest. <laughs> so, um, what uh, I would like to, uh, to do very briefly is first going to the question of the origin of SARS-CoV-2. Um, actually, it's a wrong question. Uh, we have to consider that there is no origin, no specific determined origin. It's just a process of uh, evolution and selection, just what Charles Darwin uh, explained to us 162 years ago. Uh, so the only real question to address is how, oh, what is that process? SARS-CoV-2 is a naturally occurring virus. Uh, how did it emerge? What the process of evolution? So I just want very briefly, I will take less than one minute of my talk to go over the Mojian uh, theory, uh, which is a, a narrative with no evidence, and actually we do have evidence of the contrary, because um, there was no SARS-CoV-2 in the Mojang mine. Um, we did that analysis. We analyzed um, the, the full uh, clinical uh, pattern uh, of the six miners. I had that analyzed by professionals, by clinician and radiologists working in a specialized hospital. And I, I, I don't give details. I just want you to look at the table and you see all the red items. These all red items are just uh, symptoms and clinical uh, signs which are incompatible, not compatible with SARS, with COVID-19, with uh, SARS or any kind of coronavirus. And with the exception of few viruses, basically uh, any kind of virus, it, it was not a viral disease. So this was published very recently. Um, you can have it on, on this link. I can send it to you if you, if you are interested in. Uh, I just want, don't want to, to go further. I just want to, to, to give a, a real uh, evidence-based conclusion on that aspect. Um, so, no, uh, we, are dealing, we were dealing with a novel disease. And in December 2019, was a novel disease called later on COVID-19. Then later on again, uh, declared a pandemic. And all countries worldwide were called unprepared. And that, we think it's a problem because it, it should not have been. Like, uh, uh, the reason uh, for that is that we use, probably, I mean, uh, worldwide, everybody, uh, the wrong software. The approach we, we have to uh, react to um, infectious disease and to a pandemic is strictly medical, which makes sense because it's a disease. But the problem is that medicine is by definition symptomatic. It starts when the disease is identified and the disease is characterized by a set of symptoms. Well, which means that when we have all this set of symptoms is uh, we, the physicians know that there is or suspect there is a new disease when they see a whole range of uh, pa uh, patients coming to the hospital with an unknown set of uh, symptoms. And so they, they, they consider there's a new disease. They characterize it. Uh, they, they develop tests to identify the causative agent. And they even come back later on to identify the index case. But all the time it takes to do that, when we can react, uh, it's too late. It's far too late. The virus has already spread everywhere. So we have to consider uh, something from the very beginning is that medicine addresses the disease. But what we have to address, of course, is the disease to cure people and to save the life of people. Of course, medicine is absolutely essential. But we have really to address the 
emergence of the disease, the mechanisms of emergence of the disease itself. So how to prevent the emergence of a, a, an infectious disease? The current approach, which is a proposed, is then to look for the virus in the wild, which is basically based on what we call the spillover model, which is li like the modern mind, I would say, it's a kind of uh, interruptual construction. It, it's a narrative. It's, it has never been observed, actually. It's never been built on evidence. It, it just said that we have some sort of pre-adapted zoonotic virus from a reservoir that will spill over to the human population, sometimes perhaps with uh, intermediate uh, species. Uh, there is absolutely no evidence of none of them, no technical evidence. It's, it's a theory. Um, the one major question which is not answered by the spillover model is how does this virus cross the epidemic threshold? In, in other words, the minimal number of people needed to trigger an epidemic. This is uh, a, a basic in epidemiology. It is calculated every year for influenza, for instance. So how do, do we do that? It seems that we start from one virus immediately triggers a disease or an epidemic. No, it doesn't work like that. So what we have to consider is that the real active component in the system is the virus itself, okay? It's really the virus. These coronaviruses and all the viruses, by the way, are really um, machines made to change uh, host. And they are by nature, multi-host viruses. They have evolved for that. And they are highly evolved like all viruses. And these viruses specifically, they bind to a generic receptor, which is present in many spe species because it's important for the host physiology. And for instance, ACE2 is present in all vertebrates. This is something that is encoded by your gene very deep in, in, in the genome. If there was a very specific receptor uh, uh, associated to a gene very specific to these species, the virus would be specific only to one species or closely related species. In, in that case, no. These viruses have evolved to recognize generic receptors. So they are, they are able to um, infect many, many different species. And uh, so, only thing they need is only a contact and the minimal affinity for the receptor. So we have to consider that the species barrier is an illusion, it's a myth. It, it does not exist, uh, actually. Um, another, another thing we have to consider, which is very important, is the mode of evolution of these viruses. RNA viruses, they evolve based on the quasi-species uh, system. And we have to understand something clearly from that is that this system generates a huge amount of variants. Uh, and these then variants are selected by the host. It's a host-driven uh, selection. And depending on the host, uh, the viruses which will be um, selected are not the same. Even though they may come from one single virus, after a while, in different species, you will have different viruses. And, um, and the specific mutations we observe are not uh, made before the, the infection, but after, okay? And um, so what we observe here is just a series of different viruses, cousins, and I'm not going further on that because Spiros after me will uh, describe that, but uh, SARS-CoV-2 is just a human form of the SARS metapopulation. SARS-CoV, the initial one in 2002 on SARS, is another one, okay? In another species, there will be different viruses, not SARS-CoV-2, not adapted to human, compatible, they may recognize the receptor, but not uh, adapted because adaptation is the result of evolution. Um, that's why we find in the wild, in bats and, and other animals, cousins, related viruses, but never the, the same. SARS-CoV-2 has absolutely never been found in the wild. So if, if we summarize uh, that, we have to say the medical phase we saw at, it's too late. Very important phase to, to cure people, but too late. The sympathetic phase, basically, um, we cannot do anything in terms of identification because the virus causing the disease does not exist yet. We are looking for something that does not exist. And uh, these viruses are circulating all the time. It's a very um, imp um, important flow of uh, viruses upon contact between different animals and humans. Humans are just another animal. And um, 
the, uh, then what happens within the human population, but it's the same in uh, other species, huh? um, the virus will evolve and mutate. We saw that in the previous talks. And the spirals, we talk about that. Uh, they, they mutate, and sometimes by accident, uh, uh, they may get um, more uh, transmissible or very highly transmissible. Uh, during this phase, the, the disease is not identified. There is no symptom. There may be some sporadic cases, but confused with something else. And the virus is not detected. So we don't know. We don't know it does exist, but it's evolving in our population. And, um, but it's not enough to trigger an epidemic because what it takes to trigger an epidemic is to be able to cross the epidemic threshold. And, and that is not a biological uh, accident like the first one. This, this second accident is a, a societal, is we need, it, the virus needs to go through an amplification loop. It needs to be amplified uh, to be able to infect enough people to cross the epidemic threshold and trigger the, 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 the epidemic. And Trust this me. is where we can do something. You have and, um, yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> so this now, if we look at the very recent uh, publications, this was exactly what we see with the, the article in Laos bat. Well, the capacity of bat cybercovirus to recognize a human ACE2, yes. It, it moves to, to everywhere, circulates. Circulation of Ebola virus uh, in the last outbreak in 2021, the virus did not come from any spillover. It has been circulating in the population for several years. And even we have evidence of positive selection in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, itself. So what can we do? We just need to address the societal dimension. That's the only place where we can do something. The uh, virus is uses host ecology for the transmission and the ecological niche of the human species is the human society. So uh, the, when the virus becomes humanized, adapted to humans, it also becomes socialized because its transmission is driven by societal rules. We should target that. It's the only possibility we have to prevent uh, another um, emerging disease, another uh, pandemic. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Roger, and thanks for sticking to time. Um, we're now moving on to our last speaker. Um, it's Spiros uh, Litras, who's going to talk about lessons from the history of the evolution of virus, virus for the future. Thanks. Right. Um, can you hear me all right? Can you see my screen all right? Yep. Lovely. Yeah, excellent. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me and giving me to, the opportunity to kind of close the show. Um, so I'm Spiros, I'm an evolutionary virologist based at the MRC, University of Glasgow Center for Virus Research. Um, and as Alison mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the kind of things we can learn from studying the evolutionary histories of SARS-CoV-2 and its relatives. Um, so I'm going to start off by um, kind of explaining some technicalities when we talk about evolutionary histories and virus evolution and um, that kind of can, can get misrepresented sometimes. And um, so imagine SARS-CoV-2 here, and then sometime in the past, in the near past, um, there was a very similar virus that was the progenitor of SARS-CoV-2. Now this virus doesn't exist anymore um, because it, it used to be what SARS-CoV-2 is now in the past. Um, and when we're looking for kind of origins of virus emergence, what we're actually looking for is the closest ex extant um, relative of the virus we're interested in. Um, and, you know, so essentially this virus is, you know, somewhere in nature. Um, and I should mention here that, for example, rat G13 is certainly not a progenitor of SARS-CoV-2. Um, in fact, it's not even the closest extant relative we, well, the closest relative we know of. And then if you keep looking, you'll find more um, viruses, and these are kind of further away relatives, and, and we show these structures, we call these phylogenetic trees, and that represent the relations of the viruses. Um, and I should mention that almost all the kind of close relatives um, to SARS-CoV-2 have been sampled in horseshoe bats. Now, apart from the known things in the tree, there are a lot of gaps, um, which are viruses that are out there, but we still have not sampled. Um, and these would form branches sticking out from um, random places in the tree. 
Now, the way we determine the phylogenetic relationships is by looking at the, the genome of these viruses. In the case of coronavirus, we're really talking about a series of about 30,000 um, letters, A, G, Ts, and Cs, nucleotides. And by comparing these sequences to one another, um, we can kind of spot similarities and differences that tell us how closely um, related um, the viruses are to one another. And at this point, I should really mention a very important topic, um, which is recombination, specifically for when we're trying to understand evolutionary histories of coronaviruses. Um, so here you'll see that the coronaviruses like to recombine a lot. So in nature, there's a lot of um, swapping of bits of the genomes of these viruses between one another when they co-infect the same host. And sometimes that's very clear where the recombination comes from. So this predominantly green virus has a a blue recombinant, which comes from a blue virus. And, but other times, and this is actually most of the cases, the recombination is from an unknown lineage, which we just haven't sampled yet. And now, if I were to split the genome here, um, and this is quite a simplistic example, um, and only consider the evolutionary history of the right-hand side of the genome, that would be very, very different um, from the left-hand side. And this is important because when we're talking about a whole genome pairwise identity and say, you know, this virus is 95% similar and this and that, this is very, very misleading. It does not actually represent the true evolutionary history of these viruses. Now, moving on to real examples, so this is kind of our, our phylogeny for SARS-CoV-2 and its relatives. And you can see that most of them um, have kind of different colored bits, which represent recombinant bits. And SARS-CoV-2, if you look at the map, SARS-CoV-2 was sampled in um, the city of Wuhan in Hubei, kind of central China. And then some of the closest relatives are sampled, were sampled in Yunnan, that these viruses here. But we also have very close relatives sampled um, on the very east side of China, so the entire opposite side of the country, um, as well as viruses sampled in um, kind of the Southeast Asia outside of um, China, Thailand, and Cambodia, and I'll mention Laos later on, which has already been mentioned. Um, now, I'll just quickly talk about these two viruses. So these two independent lineages of um, SARS-2-related viruses have actually been sampled in pangolins. This is, this is the only animal that we've sampled kind of wild corona, SARS-related coronaviruses. And the reason, and these have been sampled in Guangdong and Guangxi. And, and the reason I have these arrows here is because if you look at um, this traffic report from um, 2016, um, these are kind of the major routes, smuggling routes of pangolins. So the viruses have been sampled in smuggled pangolins um, that come into um, China illegally. Um, and the, the most likely explanation is that these uh, pangolins have picked up these um, essentially bat viruses somewhere in the way. Now, if we go back to the um, tree, all the other SARS-related viruses have been sampled in horseshoe bats, and we can have a closer look at that. So um, they've all been sampled in this genus Rhinolophus, which is just uh, the horseshoe bats. Um, but you can see that they've been sampled in different species, suggesting that these viruses can very quickly and easily um, jump from one bat to the other um, if they're in the same population. And we can look at the host ranges of the viruses. You can see that, um, oh, sorry, of the bats, not the viruses. Um, and you can see that some of them um, so, for example, Rhinolophus pustulus and Rhinolophus affinis have very, very extensive um, geographic ranges, which completely overlap um, the regions that I mentioned um, are essentially uh, where the, the viruses, the SARS-related viruses have been found. Some of them have kind of shorter regions, um, for example, here, Shemeli and Echinatus in Southeast Asia. Uh, but for example, Malayanus really links um, the Indo-Chinese Peninsula to China through this province of Yunnan. And um, so we have this very, very extensive geographic range where these viruses have been sampled in that completely overlaps um, the ranges of the bats these viruses are sampled in. And this recent publication and um, preprint that has already been mentioned a couple of times really fills in the gap. Um, adding Laos to the picture here. And in fact, if you account for recombination, um, two of the Laotian uh, bat viruses 
um, are actually the closest relatives to SARS-CoV-2, evolutionarily speaking, that we know of. So I'll just go to some kind of takeaway messages, which are, one, we've, we've only scratched the surface here. There's so much undiscovered diversity in this coronaviruses that are, have so many different kind of recombinant combinations um, circulating in, in horseshoe bats. And of course, they can easily um, um, jump into susceptible um, wild animals um, or humans in the case of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1. And, you know, this is really an old story because, I mean, you can see this um, article, new science article published in 2013, um, that, you know, after SARS-CoV-1 and, and MERS emergence, um, and the more we sample, essentially, the more we, we know that the, the next pandemic is coming. Um, and that was the case. Um, the geographic diversity where these viruses is concerningly wide, um, which really makes it hard to track exactly where um, such viruses um, originate from, um, for example, um, SARS-CoV-2. Now, we, we also live in a very interconnected world, and I want to mention this um, example here of um, ASFV, which is a different epidemic affecting pigs, which has been affecting um, China for the past, um, since I think the end of 2018 and the start of 2019. Um, and such ecological disruptions um, can really, really um, increase the chances of, of pathogen spillovers to humans. Um, and you know, epidemics and pandemics taking place. And finally, um, animal movement means virus movement, which kind of has been alluded throughout this sessions. Um, and this is the example that I think Bart mentioned at the very start, um, where you know, SARS-CoV-1 was actually circulating in, in farmed civet cats, um, even after the kind of human, the first human spillover had been um, contained. And you know, I already mentioned the example of the pangolins. So to finish off, these are kind of the four takeaways and I'd like to acknowledge all my um, colleagues and I'd like to thank you for your attention and hopefully that was a good way to close the session. Thanks, Pyrrhus, that was great. In fact, thank you to all the speakers, fantastic. I'm now going to um, hand over to Fee, the editor of the BMJ, who's been hosting the series to ask some questions. Fee, is that all right with you? Absolutely fine. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, goodness me, we're going to, uh, there's, there's a lot to try to cover. I think it is worth saying to those listening that we, we're not in any way intending to answer uh, <laughs> the, the, this controversy. Um, I think the aim of this session, as of the other sessions, has been really just try to scope out areas of certainty and uncertainty. And obviously, in this particular topic, there are um, many areas of uncertainty, but I think there are also, as has been shown by these excellent speeches, uh, talks, areas of certainty that we need to you know, focus on uh, to help us through this particular issue. Um, so we've had some really great questions on the Q&A and I'm gonna try in the ones I'm asking to sort of uh, pull together a range you know, in, in perhaps some composites given, given the shortness of time. Um, so let me start here, if I may, um, with uh, a question that is probably best addressed directly at, to Bart uh, in the first instance, which is, could you summarize the conditions and processes for jumping from one species to another? What, what conditions need to be in place and um, what, what sort of broad processes do you? Um... Uh, that's, that's already a complicated question. I mean, there are several factors needed that indicated and was also indicated by Spiros. I mean, this could be and new behaviors and movement of animals so that there's a more co close contact between the animals and, and humans or other animals. That's one thing that is needed, I think. But especially, I think there's evolution of these viruses and, and, and different variants being present, clearly shown by, by Spiris. And I fully agree. I mean, we only scratch the surface on, on the huge diversity of these viruses. And it, I mean, uh, I'm really impressed by this study from Laos because this is just a small uh, scratch of the, the samples, only 500 samples, and they already find a huge diversity and, and viruses able to, to jump. So what if you would sample, let's say, 1 million uh, beds there? Uh, so that's one thing. But so clearly the uh, 
the genetic diversity, selecting the viruses that can jump, and the especially the interaction with the receptor, and that's known for, for, for both for SARS viruses and MERS, is critical uh, that these viruses can enter and then subsequently can evolve. So uh, it still could be that, I mean, and that's what we see for MERS in Africa, that these viruses potentially jump and infect people, <clears throat> but that uh, they're still not pathogenic and that the additional mutations needed uh, that can occur. And that is probably what we have seen in, in, in the Middle East, that these viruses are a little bit different. So it could take quite some uh, time to, to have these variants coming up that are really causing an outbreak that is noticed. And only then I think you find these viruses uh, by, by, by sampling in humans. So this is a bit of a problem, but uh, it's a multifactorial uh, uh, process. Thank you, Bart. And whether Spiros would like to just expand on that slightly, because there's a question here about what can reliably be said about the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 or other coronaviruses occurring within humans, that, that question about how much of that evolution might occur within humans. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just add to that, that, you know, there's, there's definitely viruses out there that are currently infecting, say, bats and could easily um, infect humans given, given a, a possible contact and you know there's there's adaptations that increase the probability of infection and that's what we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 adapting to humans in the past two years um, but it's, it's really a numbers game I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, I, the, I, listening to this and trying to kind of make sense of it myself and, and my lack of expertise on the detail is going to be evident in this next summarized question but it seemed to me that that we have a, a number of possible candidates for what we might call the intermediate host and Bart you said there was um, ev no evidence of, a, of an animal intermediate host I think you said that uh, and then um, Marianne you know talked about zoonosis is probably the most likely direct as so therefore an animal as an intermediate host um, uh, and then um, this incompromised immunocompromised patient which is this you know minor theory but there have been some people in the chat saying that couldn't possibly have happened. And I think um, Roger also presented information suggesting that was very unlikely or impossible. And then a laboratory process effectively as an intermediate. And I just, I mean, whether that summary is a good enough summary, I promise almost certainly not. But would anyone, I'd, maybe I'd like to hear from, you know, each of you or whoever's willing to, to make a guess of what is the most likely. I mean, that seems to be an important issue. What is the most likely? So um, Jacques is going to start us off. <laughs> You're on mute, Jack. Oh, now yes. you're not. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, I would like to give uh, some thought about this concept of likelihood because it has been used in uh, many different ways. I'm teaching statistics, and in statistic, likelihood is really a concept that is very important, and it is different from the common sense. And in particular, we speak about probabilities for an event that did not occur yet and that has several possible outcomes. And of likelihood, when we have an event that occurred, but we have several possible uh, causes for it. We don't know which one, and then we want to weight likelihood. So indeed, the problem we are facing now is a problem of likelihood, not probabilities. But in order to estimate likelihood, you need quantifiers, and then you need probabilistic models. And for this, there is a whole school in uh, statistics called the Bayesian school, Bayesian reasoning. And I love this because it's very elegant. It's really one of the most elegant reasonings that I found in, 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 in the, the probability and uh, statistics theories. But unfortunately, each time you do this reasoning, which basically amounts to reverse the probabilities, given what I observe, what is the probability that it comes from this source, every time you do this, actually, there is always one moment where you fall on an impossibility because you have some parameter that you need to quantify, and it's simply impossible to do so. In all this whole debate, the word likelihood has been used as a sort of buzzword to disqualify some hypotheses or to qualify other ones. But let's face it, nobody today is able to measure, quantify, estimate the likelihood. So let's keep using a word that I think more relevant is plausible or uh, even likely. But let's not say that things are extremely unlikely or are uh, the most probable when we have no way to quantify this. Very helpful. And, uh, I'm going to move you on, but thank you. So we're going to go for plausibility if that's the right option. But I still think what is the most plausible, perhaps that's a way of getting around your, your comment. But I, I'm, I, I don't You mean cannot do the most probable if you have no way to measure, even if you want to 
rank the things, you need to quantify them. I, I, I would really challenge my colleagues here and, and myself, I have no, no recipe for that, for doing the, the quantification of the likelihood. What is the likelihood for a, a lab to dispose of a virus when the database has been shut and, and disappeared since uh, two years? Okay. It has been closed on 12th of September. You cannot measure the likelihood for the lab to have the, the sequence. Let me stop you there. I think that's a, a very good point. Can I ask anyone else who wants to come in on that question before I move on to, to possibly a follow on from what Jackie just said? Angela. I don't think we need to quantify uh, probability or likelihood or fight over whether we're using the right words to describe this. I think all we need to do is look at the evidence. And if you look at the evidence, you can objectively quantify the pieces of evidence that support one hypothesis over another. This is why I am leaning towards the zoonotic hypothesis um, and specifically through an intermediate species. We know um, on, on the side of the lab origin hypothesis, the sole piece of evidence is that this outbreak occurred in Wuhan. It is geographical. It is just one piece of evidence. On the zoonotic side, we know that uh, at a farm um, in Hubei province, right outside Wuhan, in 2003, they sampled a SARS-related coronavirus from a palm civet. We know that uh, markets, wet markets in Wuhan were selling animals that are known to be susceptible to SARS coronavirus too. We know that they came from a common supplier. Um, there are, and we know from looking at the virus and how it has evolved throughout the course of the pandemic, that this virus was in no way pre-adapted to people. This virus is a generalist virus that's capable of infecting multiple species. So if we look at the objective scientific evidence, there's simply more of it on the side of a zoonotic origin than there is on the laboratory side. Angela, now, I, that's not... Sorry, yeah. that's really, really very, very clearly put. I'm just trying to affect some of the questions coming through because I think the question that would come as a response to can that... I, can, I, can I add something? Yes, though? do, Mara, and then I'll come in with my follow-up. Yeah. Because, so, um, if you really go piece by piece on evidence, um, what uh, is also, uh, it's, it's not clear to me that this really started in Wuhan, because we, it's clear from the studies done so far that there was a widespread circulation in December, uh, but that those were not the first cases. Um, and there is uh, links with clusters of viruses in a different province, which really needs to be looked at. And I think unless you really go back to those earlier patients, it's very difficult to, to, to conclude anything from the presence in a market in, in Wuhan, which uh, for all we know now, uh, could just have been a super spreading event as they have occurred all over the world. Um, so can I ask you then, Marin and others, um, it, when we say we have more evidence of the of the um, zoonotic and nature spillover uh, episode, um, some people are asking, well, might that not be because we haven't looked sufficiently hard and because China has not allowed us to look sufficiently hard at the, for, for, other, for, for the evidence, including, Marion, the evidence that you've just mentioned about, um, you know, the, the, those early cases. Why do we not know about those? Why have we not got that information? Does that not help? Does that not become a source of conspiracy theories about cover-ups and marriage. Yeah, well, so... Um, yeah, I, for God's sake. What's that? Sorry, there was someone else commenting. Oh, <laughs> no, you carry on, man. Yeah, so um, I think that needs to be looked at. Uh, the the um, I think it, it is not well understood just how much work has been put in. Uh, so those studies that uh, we uh, asked uh, were done by uh, roughly a thousand people um, and uh, generated a lot of new information that was put together. Um, and, and then the conclusions were, you need to redo them in different places. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, and that's what needs to happen, but it's not, I, I do not, uh, you know, agree to the sort of the general line uh, that says uh, China is not doing uh, anything to, to, to help this, because that's just not true. Okay. Um, there okay. is additional work to be done, definitely. There's hesitance to do that work, definitely. Um, but uh, I think we should also uh, be respectful of what has been done. 
Okay, that's very helpful. I, I, I'm conscious of time here, but I would like to just hear from everyone, if I might, briefly. I've got a final question after this, but um, what, what additional information, what additional data investigation studies would you each like to see to take us through this? So I'm going to, I mean, randomly because of my screen, Roger, what, what would you like to see? Just one or two very briefly bits that you feel we need to know. Roger, you're on mute, sorry. Roger, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, very briefly, what I would say is just to say what I've been, uh, repeat what, what I've been said before. Um, especially in this issue, we really need to uh, base everything on real evidence. We, 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 should, we should move away from all opinions um, and um, all narratives what, because what, we have to stick on uh, evidence-based uh, aspects. And really. what more evidence would you like? Just one piece of additional evidence that you would like than we have? As I said, we, we need to see, we should not consider um, COVID-19 as a unique thing. Um, it's one epidemic or pandemic that uh, has emerged, like others, we, we need to analyze also others. And uh, we don't have this discussion on the lab leak or whatever, or with other diseases. It, it doesn't occur with uh, Ebola or, or other diseases. So we need to get a, a broader view of the evolution of the virus, of the way the disease uh, can emerge on different uh, okay. examples of diseases worldwide. Okay. Thank you, that's very helpful. Alison, what would one or, one or two things would you like to see? You know, I think this is an issue where um, the, seeing more data and forensic examination of data relating to research that was conducted and specimens and, that were obtained by laboratories in Wuhan, as well as the US government and other governments and labs around the country that were working um, or funding this research being far more transparent. At the moment in the United States, the only way information is coming out of our federal government is because journalism organizations with deep pockets have had to file lawsuits under the Federal Freedom of Information Act. And there have been similar issues with obtaining information in other countries as well. So that's an area that I'd like to see more information. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, well, obviously there are many gaps in the evidence um, and uh, I think we need to fill those in. But I do think that, that we need to take the evidence wherever we can get it um, and I think that really the way to doing this is to have two things happen. We need more transparency um, about how these labs are regulated, about what kind of body of evidence exists. And we need more international cooperation in order to achieve that transparency. Um, in order to have a truly uh, science-driven, evidence-driven investigation, we do need to have collaboration between the international interdisciplinary community of scientists. Thank you very much for that. Jonathan. Oh, hi, thank you, Fee. So, you know, the key thing here is, seems to be the single most important piece of evidence that could be revealed are the databases of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So they just shortly before the pandemic, they took their huge database of all the viruses that they were working on at the time offline and they've never made it available. And somebody asked the question here, what did, did they make that available to, to uh, the WHO? And, and if not, why not? And why did the who not ask for it? This is, could be made available in a microsecond. Thank you. Thank Absolutely you very much. Boggling. Thank you. Marion, what would you like to see um, additional information? Um, uh, I would like to see the uh, recommended studies, like uh, particularly looking for earlier cases. So doing a comparative uh, search, both serological and virological, where possible in anywhere where there has been earliest evidence of cases. So that is back further in Hubei, that is in Sichuan, that is maybe in Italy, uh, and whatever other places have inklings of information with the same methodology. So you, you can actually compare the data and then go and interview and grill those cases. Thank you very much. Jack, what would you like to see? You're on mute, sorry. <laughs> I would like to say that I, I cannot agree more with my colleagues on the fact that 
we need to uh, base our reasoning and discussions on evidence. And this is completely clear. And this is exactly what we wrote in our uh, call uh, to the journals. Now, I would like to say something about the fact that enumerating evidences is not science. For instance, the so-called critical review that was published by Holmes is enumerating all the evidences for one hypothesis, natural zoonosis, and enumerating all the evidence or evidences, all the arguments, let's say, against another one. But the second thing is that there is a clear bias because the data that we have now is biased because clearly there has been data hiding. And it, it, I think everybody knows it, you know it, I know it. No, this doesn't mean that things happened. And this is my point. Thank you. It is not because the people have hidden the databases, have withdrew uh, genomes from uh, GenBank and so on. All these things have been demonstrated. It yeah. is not because of that, that the people have something to hide. We cannot understand the reason. We cannot infer that this was hidden because there was a problem of uh, lab leak. However, we need data. And you cannot say that the only data available is uh, promoting the natural zoonosis when all the other data has not been uh, disclosed and that the WHO Commission had neither the mandate nor the power, the capacity to ask these questions. So okay, this is why we ask for a real full evidence-based investigation. Short of thank time, you. but thank you very much for making that point. Spiros, what would you like to see as your, your, your one or two extra bits of evidence or, or approaches? Very um, yeah, one, so just one thing that hasn't been mentioned, I think it's the most important for preventing future pandemics as well. So the one thing missing from the data I look at is the movement and the distribution, the exact ecological distribution of the bats that harbor these viruses. Um, so we're really, we're really lacking ecological data here that should be put into the picture. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for, for that brief answer. Diego, uh, and sorry, just remember to use, speak into a microphone. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe it's better now. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you. What would you like to see? So uh, basically, we know that uh, coronavirus infects several mammals and mammals animals. So we should keep on searching coronavirus in, on those animals, not only in China, but basically over the world. There is a lot of coronaviruses in Africa also. So basically expanding our knowledge about all these uh, animal, non-human uh, coronaviruses should be very helpful to better understand what happened in general and what happens in general in the, in the coronavirus uh, family. Thank you very much. And finally, Bart, I think I've asked everyone, Bart, what, what, what one or two approaches or bits of information? No, more or less in line with my own said uh, that, that, I mean, we have the methods to detect the viruses and, and <clears throat> that's quite straightforward. I think the methods to detect uh, present or earlier infections with serology are a bit more difficult and we need really uh, <clears throat> solid methods there and uh, to also to investigate earlier reports, for example, from Italy and other uh, parts of the world. It's important to investigate those. So, <clears throat> there needs to be more effort on, on that uh, track, I think. Fantastic. Um, well, I'm going to bring this to a close. I just want to thank everyone for their contributions. Uh, we haven't, of course, we never intended to, to find an answer here, but I hope that we have, for those listening, given some sense of the, the breadth of the debate. Um, I think we would all agree that the, the more we can discover about the origins of COVID, the more likely we will be to find uh, ways to prevent future pandemics, which is perhaps really the major um, emphasis that, 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 that should um, inform this ongoing debate. Uh, greater transparency on all counts and a real focus on data and evidence is going to have to be our, our route forward. Um, thank you so much to our speakers. Really appreciate your contributions and please do continue the discussion. This will be available on YouTube at the BMJ's channel there and we look forward to hearing from viewers with your questions. Thank you again to all our speakers. Very good to have you with us.